I, like a lot of other type A folks, was a micromanager. I was a perfectionist, but the team didn't feel empowered. And so I said, the three things I need to focus on are team, culture, and strategy. And if I just do those three things right, the rest will take care of itself. Welcome back, everybody. Rich B. Baker, founder of Collector Responsibility, here today with another episode of the Mission Driven Podcast. This is a podcast all about mission driven entrepreneurship. For profit, nonprofit, we don't care. All we care about is that you're looking out the window in your community, city, country, or the world, and you're trying to find a way to deliver a solution into these problems. In this episode, I'm extremely excited to be joined by an old friend, Andy Klump, who in 2008 founded the Clean Energy Associates, or CEA, a leading solar energy and storage engineering services firm with more than 150 engineers deployed around the world, supporting their clients in solar, batteries, and green hydrogen. He's someone I met actually, I think about 20 years ago when he had a real job, but had a massive vision at the time, and it's a huge honor to have him here to join us to talk about how he turned that vision into reality. Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for taking the time. As a starting point, it'd be great if you could introduce yourself and talk to us about what, what your vision is. Absolutely. Well, Richard, uh, once again, it's great to reconnect with you and thanks again for the opportunity to, to chat with your audience. On a personal vision statement, I enable uh, leaders that are able to impact the renewable energy industry. And that's what I practice on a daily basis. Mm. But in terms of the company vision, we established our vision statement in 2015. And our vision statement is by 2025 to be the leading global solar and energy storage engineering services firm that creates tangible impact with every client. And so that was something we've set as a vision back in 2015 when we had 30 folks or so. And now here we are at 250, uh, you know, nine years later. Going back 15, 16 years, what was the founding story for CEA? I mean, you know, what was your initial idea? What was the pain point you're trying to solve? So at that point in time, uh, 16 years ago, when I first established CEA, I had the vantage point of being an officer at a publicly traded company called Trina Solar. And Trina was a small uh, 75 megawatt capacity module and ingot away from manufacturer, which mm -hmm. for those not in the industry, it's very, very, very small. But at that time, Trina was a top <laughs> 20 player and uh, they had this ambition to go public. So mm -hmm. I was a part of that IPO deal team that listed the company on the New York Stock Exchange. I helped Trina scale and grow to become a multi-gigawatt player. We grew the company about 10x in those two years. So at the time wow. I started CEA, I actually saw a massive potential. I mean, the solar industry had just started. Literally, the total yeah. industry uh, was literally uh, you know, 1.6 gigawatts. Uh, you know, once again, you could fit it all into one conference hall. Like None of these shows were more than three or 400 folks. They were all very small. And, use. and uh, yet I saw in those two years, Trina went public, 10 other Chinese solar companies went public, the industry mm. started to grow, you started to have larger you know, companies really kind of growing and scaling and, and the industry started to take off in a meaningful way. Yeah. But there still was a dearth of talent in the industry who could really connect the dots. Mm. And I said, look, if I can just help solve problems for existing Trina clients, there's gotta yeah. be a business I can do on this. And I kept doing more and more supply chain engagements and then doing mm -hmm. quality control visits to different factories and new factory audits. And I realized, hey, I keep getting asked these questions. I was doing this for yeah. free for the first couple of times. <clears throat> like, when I started charging it and making a business out of it. So that was really the initial foundation of CA, both on a personal as well okay. as on a professional front. What was the process of moving from you going from free to getting paid? to 30 people six years later, and now to 250. It was a painful process. Let me assure you, I had no clue what I was doing probably three, four, five years into my business. I will say in two years in the business, I was still working from home. It was 2010 at the time. And I was just using uh, very either free or low cost interns to come to my home and help uh, do stuff. But it wasn't until really 2015 when we had had some success, we reached a few dozen folks. I had yeah. hired UA uh, or you know, professionals to come in and really start to professionalize that part of the organization. That's when I realized to grow and scale beyond this 30 person threshold, I had to build a true culture. I had to build a company with lasting values. And yeah. then we grew to 50, 60 folks and kind of plateaued for a little while, leading yeah. right up into COVID. And that's when, uh, you know, there's a lot of chaos that happened and, you know, half our business just kind of melted away. But, you know, once again, because mm -hmm. we had diversified, because we brought in bright leadership, because we found had founding principles and core values to really run our business, 
that's what allowed us to go to the next level and yeah. uh, really grow to 100, 150, then 200 uh, on up to where we are right now at 250. What were some of the, the warning signs that you were, you're growing a little bit too fast or a system that you had built was not fit for purpose anymore? Look, there were many warning signs, uh, many different points along the way. So uh, it was a constant flow of problems from e through each of those phases. You know, one of the big signs of pain points is that we're just losing people left, right, and center. And mm. so it wasn't until, unfortunately, two years later, I discovered that and I realized, hey, our culture is toxic and I yeah. have to drive our culture. And I would say, once again, we hit that 50 plateau for a little while and yeah. we basically had to reinvent the culture. We did a lot of things that really gave full transparency to the culture. I did a 360 degree review on myself. I hired an executive coach to come in and literally talk to 20 some odd folks in the team. Yeah. And she told me, she said, Andy, in 20 years as an executive coach, I had never come across an executive who is unequivocally d disliked by his team and the negative comments they had wow. were just blew me off. But the reality was I, like a lot of other type A folks, was a micromanager. I was a perfectionist and I went into yeah. a lot of excruciating detail, but the team didn't feel empowered. And so right. I had to learn how to fix myself first. I did a lot yeah. of self-correction uh, with, with that coach. And then I had installed systems and processes that allowed feedback mechanisms from the team to me on an open basis. But then mm. we started to address the issues, prioritize those. We have to try to hire uh, kind of proper HR leadership, proper executive leadership. We divided the companies into multiple P and L's and that's what really allowed us to grow and scale. But I said, the three things I need to focus on are team culture and strategy. And if mm. I just do those three things, right, the rest will take care of itself. And so that's when we really went through this hyper growth and it was crazy yeah. because we actually grew faster as we grew larger. And I was shocked. Mm -hmm. Once again, when you unleash the energy, the limitless energy is part of my personal vision. Yeah. Uh, so many new folks who either have industry background or who bring outside background to help grow a certain aspect of the business, so much can be accomplished. What are some of the critical things that you had to do differently yourself to turn the corner as a culture? Start to finish, it was a two year process. I really, from uh, 2015, when I really got religion and realized this has to change, I got that 360 review, I yeah. said, wow. And mm. we had a, a great year in 2016. I, you know, the industry was peaking, things were going yeah. great, up and to the right. But once again, growth sometimes hides problems. And then right. 2017, we got shellacked with a big industry downturn, policy change in the US. And so when you go through a downturn, a lot more of these issues got to bubble up. But look, it was a lot of one-on-one -on -one meeting with folks. It was a lot of like putting out these scorecards and transparently saying, hey, this is my 360. I'm, I'm being yeah. totally naked in front of the entire team. You know, I read through every single Pat Lencioni book uh, about culture. I shared learnings with the team. I wrote book reports. Yeah. We talked about our leadership team. I made mistakes hiring folks who weren't aligned with my future vision. So right. those folks had to take time to leave. And we went through a lot of turnover. But once, mm. once we nailed the right culture and we nailed the right team and our leaders yeah. were aligned around that 2017, that's when all of a sudden you saw our retention rates going from 30% mm. turnover of losing that much talent mm. each year to then all of a sudden having like 95% retention. The other factor that's, that's not well known by a lot of organizations is high culture companies often outperform their peers financially. Right. So right. we had records, uh, you know, record bookings, revenues, profits, everything was kind of up and to the right. Once we sit and, you know, address the culture issues, uh, yeah. and once again, it's not as if just like a check the box. I did this one survey or I had this one follow-up. We oh. changed our communication style. We set yeah. up uh, monthly all hands meetings, AHMs that we still do today. And that's still part mm -hmm. of CA DNA seven years later. And it's just simple things like that. They, 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 the, those systems and processes kind of build on their own, but you have to drive the ownership at the team level and give the yeah. delegate and back off to let them have it. So does that mean that you had to step away from being a micromanager or does that mean that you could micromanage some things, but then you just create a process and you found the right person you could trust? I would say the biggest factor is I had to change myself and I had yes. to say, oh, rather than jumping in solving this problem, which I know how to do and I've done 10,000 times, Mm. I'm going to let the team do it. I had to stop and really just jump in and say, oh, here's, here's what you do to say, how would you solve this problem? And to be patient to let the team make their own mistakes 
such that they do that. And I remain disciplined about saying, how do I set the direction? Once again, team culture strategy. If I focus more time on developing, recruiting and developing the team, establishing the right culture, so the culture, you know, let's get that core value of do the right thing. And so that yeah. answers a lot of questions. So that eliminates a lot of this unnecessary work. The final point is the strategy. And so we have dedicated strategy sessions. Simple yeah. things like changing our meeting cadence to have a 15 minute daily huddle. It never lasts more than 15 minutes. Sometimes it's only five minutes, but mm -hmm. that daily check-in with everyone in the entire company. And that took years to pull yeah. that off, but you have yeah. to have systems and processes that give you data. And then you have to empower the leaders to make decisions based on that data. That's what yeah. has allowed us to grow and scale at the level we're at today. How, what are some of like the key lessons you've learned along this path for yourself? How to, how to do this? and how to do it right, even when even when it is up and down? Like, what, what's the mindset shift that you've had? Um, there's a great book I read on this topic called Your Oxygen Mask First. Uh, as the name implies, uh, to really be a true leader, you mm. have to put your own oxygen mask on first. When that plane is going down and out of oxygen, you can only do so much in the two minutes or three minutes of oxygen you have. But if you put your oxygen mask on first, then all of a sudden you can help others put their oxygen masks on. So mm. that is um, one of the key lessons it took me many years to have uh, and figure out. So I was putting my family aside, my kids aside, my wife's needs aside, and focusing yeah. first on the business. If I had not done that, if I not solved our client issues, or we have the same set of client relationships, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it would be as successful, but I would have been a lot more sane as a person. But I had yeah. to go through those turmoils and realize, hey, look, I have to prioritize myself. I have to mm -hmm. prioritize my family. I have to continue to invest in my team. And then mm -hmm. I go back and say, okay, what are the customer issues that are, you know, are, are resolved? One of the other key insights I'll say is how do you take the resources that you have and make yeah. them extraordinary? And that's mm. the reality of how we got in the business in the Philippines. I said, look, I don't have a high budget to hire a customer service team in the U.S. to solve a bunch of problems. Let me go to a place like the Philippines, find people that are willing to work the night shift and, mm. and uh, you know, handle issues on behalf of our U.S. clients. And now we have a 30-person team in the Philippines. You've mentioned books. You've mentioned EO. You mentioned having executive coach. What was your process for finding those resources and how, how have the different ones helped you or how do you look at each one differently? Well, uh, unending curiosity is part of the core values of CEA and absolutely, it's about asking a lot of questions and mm -hmm. having to revisit your assumptions based on what's going on. So, you know, I've referenced a few of the books, you know, Scaling Up was the was the, one of the key books that we read early, I read early on and we tried to deploy the Scaling Up methodology written by Vern Harnish, it's based, based on Rockefeller Habits uh, yeah, Foundation. He mm -hmm. built hundreds of companies and had his leadership teams go through 40 different metrics. And so we went through those and we literally, year one, we did this, we had one out of 40 that was correct. And it took time with my executive coach go, just to go down the list. And now mm -hmm. we're right at 37 out of 40. So we've deployed wow. many of those, but it is very, very difficult. Uh, so yes, there were many books, uh, but it was this constant process of asking questions and also encouraging others. We actually just uh, gave our uh, annual awards out uh, just today, in fact, and yeah. we have a Curious George Award, which is based on the uh, uh, both the Unending Curiosity Value and also uh, George Talupas, who's one of our executives uh, at, the, at the company. Uh, yeah. Both love to ask questions, but this uh, individual, she won the award because she asked good questions and tough questions that deserve a lot of reflection but I'm constantly mm. reading books and encouraging my team to yeah. do the same uh, because those new ideas, that's what fuels innovation and uh, helps us meet the needs of, the, of our clients. So you're at 250 now. What's the vision, man? Where do you want to go from here? There is literally unlimited growth potential of solar. I joined the industry when it was literally a fraction of a hundredth of a percent. And now we're at 5% right. of global energy supply. But there's a mm. lot of projections that go out and show solar can be 40, 50% within yeah. the next decade and a half, oh, I know. So yeah. 35, we can literally see a 10X growth in the industry. But guess what? There's so many problems and issues. Yeah. The need for an independent third-party technical advisor is absolutely there. So I just mm -hmm. literally see no limitation to our growth in solar energy storage. We've now entered green hydrogen, but there's many yeah. different facets of the energy transition that need a role uh, for us uh, to play that part. And so, once again, with yeah. our new parent uh, company, Intertech, they have yeah. access to 
the resources and wind and other areas that we didn't have initially. And so together we're growing in a hundred plus countries where they have a physical presence. And now we can grow and scale that much faster than we ever could have done before. How do you map your strategy, your products, your pricing, so that you can capture as much of that along the way? You have a combination of organic growth with clients. You have new service offerings, and then you have new markets. And that's where I was mm -hmm. highlighting Intertech's uh, platform of a thousand test labs in a hundred countries yeah. helps us. We wanted uh, a seven figure job in Brazil just because they had a presence there. So mm. there are ways when you have access to a large infrastructure to grow from a geographic standpoint. Uh, yeah. But look, there's a ton of growth potential. Just as I mentioned, the industry is 1.6 gigawatts back when I started. It now surpassed over 300 gigawatts this last year. Some estimates wow. in the high 300s, maybe close to 400 gigawatts. So the growth potential is massive. And as we add other service offerings and enter other industry segments, other geographies, there's growth all around. It's just a matter yeah. of uh, aligning the, the team, uh, hiring the right uh, professionals at each of those levels and continue mm -hmm. to expand uh, on a meaningful international basis. So that's, uh, that's our plan. That's awesome, man. Now you mentioned Intertech a couple times here and the crowd's probably wondering, what's that all about? Well, you might have started in a recession, but you also exited in the middle of a Shanghai lockdown. And I want to know, like, how did you do that? What was your process for exiting as an entrepreneur? And what were some of the key considerations around that deal for you in terms of knowing if it's the right partner, if the dollar amount's right? Like, what, what were some things that you were thinking about when you were approached by this? So, mm. look, we, we actually did have, uh, I'd say around 2019, late 2019, there were several companies that approached us that were far larger than I'd ever seen before. Uh, some of those were industry strategics, some were private equity firms, but then yeah. COVID happened. I said, Hey, that's perfect. I put everything on pause, said there's no rush. And so yeah. at some point I said, look, I realize, uh, you know, I'm in a different territory. We had folks in, you know, 10 countries at that time. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, it's, if something were to happen to me, get hit by the bus or whatever, uh, you know, I, I need to have a better system and I had a better system. We had an ERP, we had leadership in place, but I yeah. said, look, Having access to a corporate parent uh, would bring us into deal sizes and engagements with other larger companies that we couldn't just get on our own. So I yeah. said, I saw the value. So yes, you know, hired a banker, went through a process. You know, Intertech was the, the best strategic partner and it's been a great, um, great match thus far. So very, very happy and continue to grow and expand with, uh, uh, with them as our parent. And we're part of the Intertech group of companies now. And so just a little bit on the emotional side of things, like you're going through this process, as you said, it was a process. What were some of the things that you really held on to through this conversation? Because I imagine there's some details you're like, look, I don't like that. But you're you're looking at the other side of like, hey, that's that's what we're doing it for. How do you work yourself through that? And then how as a as the founder of the organization, do you do you let half of your baby go or 70% of your baby go or the whole thing go? Like how do you get through that process yourself? Some of the things I said were core and uh, dear to me is one, we had to maintain CA's culture. That was extremely mm -hmm. important. Intertech recognized our winning culture. They supported it. Uh, they had uh, values that were very aligned with ours. And so yes. I said, great, that checks the box. Secondly, um, in their deal proposal, they offered to keep us as a standalone PL. So I said, great, that's fine. And I think I think the third element was I wanted to see a strategic path to growth. And the mm. fact that they have a thousand test labs in hundred countries, we are not a company with test labs otherwise, but massive growth yep. potential, a lot of synergy. There's a lot of test lab work we're winning now because we have these test labs in house and there's yeah. multiple opportunities where we can cross sell and upsell both our clients with intertech services, but also their clients mm. with CA services. So it really uh, was a great match. But you have a boss now. How does that feel? Yes, yes. Uh, look, Bertram Malay is uh, my direct uh, direct boss, and it is uh, it's great. We have a really great relationship. Uh, he made the comment to me. He's like, Andy, I do this as a partnership, and you know, he's given me a lot of freedom and flexibility. But look, we still have uh, you know corporate mandatory controls that we follow, and once again, Intertech's a public traded company. And so, yep. yes, you know, you give up some control. Look, I'd like to shift on a dime and make quick decisions. Uh, but look, sometimes it's actually very helpful to have 
a process you go through, you end up mm -hmm. saving yourself a lot of time and effort because you don't make uh, erroneous decisions. I've seen how our business can be streamlined, how we can use cash more effectively, how we can mm -hmm. engage with clients and be at a proper stance where folks say, hey, we can, we have a, a proper legal department now who's backs us up and we can spit out responses very quickly to key issues uh, yeah. that we couldn't have done before. So. Yeah, look, the, the reality is there is, um, you've got to give up some level of control, but there's a yeah. lot to, and that industry needs CEA and CEA needs the growth. And so there's uh, there's some areas that are absolutely worth making these trade-offs. Last question, my friend. If you were talking to an aspiring entrepreneur, someone who's in the early stages, they're still in their house, what are some of the things that you wish that you knew to make their life a little bit easier? I absolutely would have invested in uh, establishing a clear, and concise culture. It doesn't have to be a very convoluted, uh, you know, three-page document with all these different, uh, you know, annexes right. and everything else. But having a clear set of core values and then hiring to that. This is not rocket yeah. science. Anyone can do it. Uh, but once again, set your culture first and build that block by block. <laughs>